I'm going to start on time. So uh, here we go. I'll go back to the introductory slide. Um, say again? Oh, yes. OK, we'll wait for a moment. And I'll put this in a coat pocket. Very good. Right, that sounds good. Yes, very good. OK. So this is, uh, we're meant to encourage uh, audience participation here. So I'm going to give you a choice of pointers. So here's the red pointer. Here's the violet pointer. Here's the green pointer. All those in favor of the violet pointer. The violet. OK. OK. Oh, green. Green, okay. Violet, there, there are some hands. I think I saw seven hands go up for violet. Green, okay. And then I think red is going to lose because already the votes have been exhausted by the first two choices. So uh, nobody for red, I think. Okay, so we're going to go for the green pointer. I'm a local person, so I didn't get a gift. I had to buy my own green pointer. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so... Very good. And I'll tell you what, Reiner, I can introduce myself. Uh, you can do that. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, yeah. great. So uh, here's the introduction. This is me. This is my collaborator, Susie Lidstrom. Susie, we plan for Susie to come here on sabbatical uh, for the next semester. She will come here. Uh, she can do the, uh, she can continue as editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Swedish Academy anywhere in the world. So she's going to do it from here in the fall semester, and they'll be paying her salary. So uh, I hope she's among us doing, and that certainly will benefit Texas A&M, I think, if she's here doing that job. See, we were stimulated by a couple of books, or a number of books, the so-called Trilogy of Five Books by Douglas Adams. This is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is Life, the Universe, and Everything. But we were also stimulated by these books, which are absolutely wrong. These books claim there's an end of science or an end of physics. This is actually not a bad book, but the premise is wrong. There's not an end of science showing up. Science is going to go on forever because we have more mysteries than we had in the past, actually, not fewer. And so one of our major points was that the young people in the audience and also the older people in the audience have at least as much opportunity to make major contributions to human understanding and to science as in any previous century. So we're going to run through the various mysteries. But with the word of warning is, uh, as you all know, you have to work very hard to achieve anything in science. Richard Feynman warns us about this. To even do the smallest thing in science requires an enormous amount of work. And here's something from Marie Curie. She made the comment, sometimes I had to spend a whole day stirring a boiling mass with a heavy iron rod, nearly as big as myself, and I would be broken with fatigue at the day's end. So if you're not broken with fatigue at the day's end, you haven't really been doing your job. That's a message to graduate students and postdocs and faculty. And this is Jocelyn Bell Burnell. At the end of my PhD, I could swing a hammer. She was kind enough to send this photograph to me when I asked for one. She looked for a week through her records and, and dug this up. You can find these uh, images of her all over the internet, but to find one that you can get permission to use is difficult. And she sent this to us. This is her with her uh, four-acre radio observatory that she built herself with some help and that she used in her discovery of pulsars about a half century ago. And of course, she's still around. And a few months ago, I sent this photograph. Let me ask this question. Who knows uh, Lynn Margulis? Anybody know who she is? OK, so a lot of people do. OK, very good. I didn't know her name at all until a couple of years ago. Uh, she made one of the greatest discoveries, had one of the greatest ideas in the history of biology. Uh, the, her point, her, the discovery is, or the realization was, that cell organelles, uh, such as the mitochondria in your bodies and the chloroplast in plants, were once independent bacteria. So you consist of about 20, 37 trillion cells, uh, a vital component of your cells are the mitochondria. They're the powerhouses. You couldn't function without them. They have their own DNA. And uh, at one point, the reason you have these mitochondria is that a remote ancestor of yours, perhaps 2 billion years ago, merged with a bacterium, and that bacterium, that bacterium became uh, a mitochondrion. 
So essentially, you contain the fossil remains of that uh, bacterium of a couple billion years ago. So this is our question number 38. And it is sad that the uh, projector does not show the things that they should, they should be shown. This is one, a typical one of our 42 questions, question 38. How did life on Earth begin, and how did complex life originate? Um, there are a lot of theories of how Earth, or several theories at least, of how life began on Earth. Uh, but an equally important question is how complex life emerged, and complex means multicellular. Uh, according to one interpretation, uh, the life on Earth would always have been limited to one-celled creatures, prokaryotes, if not, uh, if there had not been a merger of this one-celled creature with another one-celled creature, which eventually led to the three, to the last of the three domains of life on Earth. There are three domains of life, the uh, archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes. And the eukaryotes are, of course, what you think of as big life ordinarily. That's all the plants, all the animals around us, even the mushrooms. Those are eukaryotes. And apparently, they, according to one interpretation, all this richness of multicellular life on Earth would not have uh, come to be if it had not been for this merger, say, a couple billion years ago. Is this a low probability bottleneck to intelligent life? Does this explain why we don't see intelligent life out there except for ourselves? Uh, that's one idea. But this is one of our questions. It's a typical question. So that's life. Then we come to the universe. Here are a couple of people who have made major contributions to our understanding of the universe, Kip Thorne and Stephen Hawking, with four Hollywood movie stars. So here you see David Gaizzi, Gaizzi uh, Anne Hathaway, uh, Jessica Chastain, Michael Caine. And this is at the world premiere of Kip Thorne's movie. Now, Kip Thorne is a brilliant person. Uh, one of the greatest relativists, uh, who uh, will probably win a Nobel Prize in the near future for the discovery of gravitational waves, since he's the number two person um, in this chain of events that led to the LIGO discovery. Um, and uh, he came to the brilliant realization, being a brilliant person, that uh, Caltech is right next to Hollywood. So he's been taking advantage of that fact for a long time now. Uh, Here's the number one person behind LIGO, Reiner Weiss. This, this uh, photograph was taken by me, actually, at Texas A&M uh, a number of years ago, about 20 years ago. Uh, and um, essentially, the inception of LIGO was uh, Ray Weiss's ideas on how to use gravitational, on how to use interferometry, laser interferometry, to observe gravitational waves. Uh, Kip Thorne came into the story a little later, 1975. Uh, we have this typical kind of interaction between a theorist and an experimentalist. Namely, the experimentalist had the good sense to reserve a room at a NASA conference. The theorist forgot to reserve a room. So when Kip Thorne showed up, he asked if he could share the room with Ray Weiss. And the second fact about experimentalists and theorists is that experimentalists are more generous than theorists. So Ray Weiss said yes. They stayed up all night, had a conversation. And that basically was a major step in the birth of LIGO. And of course, here are the famous LIGO observations and now there are more since then, but these are the major observations that represent the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy. And everything, now onto everything. Well, what is everything? Uh, here's, uh, here's Lynn Margulis again, at a younger age. Uh, the wedding, wedding day for Carl Sagan and uh, Lynn Margulis, 1957. Uh, he was more famous, but she was has had a, she was a vastly more influential scientist than her husband because she gave us one of the great realizations in the history of biology. The fact that complex life involved this uh, uh, merger of a bacterium with another one cell creature at some point. On the other hand, he gave us the television series Cosmos. This was the original series. There's now another series with, um, uh, tell me the name of the astronomer again. Yes, exactly. So we have another Cosmos series now, but this was the original Cosmos series, which was very influential. And um, uh, so that was certainly um, a major factor. At that point, we understood what the Cosmos was. I should also mention that uh, Lynn Margulis' uh, sister married uh, Sheldon Glashow, who almost ended up here at one point. He was thinking about coming to Texas A&M, but he ended up at Boston University instead. But now we have an even broader view of what is everything. Uh, and this is the idea of the multiverse, a controversial idea, but a lot of uh, very smart people believe in it, including, for example, apparently Steven Weinberg. And uh, 
Uh, so here's the, you know, this is a metaphor. This is a lighthearted, you know, um, trivial metaphor for what the multiverse really means. There are really profound physical reasons that, are, that motivate people to believe in the multiverse. And we list the five major reasons in our paper. So you can go to our paper to read more about this. But this is the, you know, the trivial version of it. So we have, uh, so he is asking her, uh, would you like to go out for a drink? And she, on one path, in one universe, she says, uh, sorry, I'm too tired. And they both end up lonely on opposite sides of the planet. The other universe involves her saying, why not? Sure, why not? And would they live happily ever after? But uh, on the other hand, there's a quotation here from Brian Hall. He's responding to a poem by uh, Robert Frost in a similar vein. It's called The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood and so on. And so you, you choose the two, one of the two paths. But he warns us that whichever way you go, you're sure to miss something good on the other path. So maybe she was happier actually on this other, this other universe. Now, you don't have to look at these because we're going to come back to every one of them again. But this gives you a general feeling. Here's the first third of our 42 questions, starting with the cosmological constant. And then with this question, which was motivated by uh, the mass being measured for the Higgs boson in the last few years. Here's the second set of questions. And here's the final set, ending with, uh, you know, what is consciousness? The consciousness you all, that we all have. What is it? In, in, phys in physical terms. I have some apologies because as we look around here, we see uh, some fraction of our uh, faculty, graduate students, researchers, and most of the people yeah, in the Texas A&M uh, who are here at Texas A&M and, and in the Department of Physics and Astronomy are doing things that are very relevant to these questions, these, these 42 central questions. So we all hope to make some you know, small contribution to, to these, these, uh, these questions, solving these mysteries. But we can't possibly go through the greater than 200 names that we have in the department that are doing very significant research. So, you know, it would be very rude if I just listed only a few people. So you'll see the pictures of about three people, but this was just kind of a random thing. This doesn't mean that these are the only people because as we look out here, we see a lot of people who are doing very significant research, of course. Um, uh, but also, this is a global talk. This has been given recently, actually, by Susie at two international conferences in the last few weeks, and we uh, plan to present at other conferences in the future. So this is not just a local talk, and that's one reason also why we don't mention the names of the, great, of the people here who are making great contributions on these questions. Well, here's the first question. Uh, the cosmological constant. Uh, in standard physics, the vacuum has an enormous energy. There's an enormous positive contribution due to the zero-point energy of the gauge fields, starting with the electromagnetic field. There's an enormous negative contribution that comes from Higgs condensation, the standard Higgs boson, and presumably other Higgs condensates that formed associated with grand, unifica grand unification. So we have these enormous positive and negative contributions, and there's no reason why they should cancel. So this is a great mystery. Uh, a lot of solutions have been proposed to solve this mystery. People like Steven Weinberg have become disgusted with all these solutions. They uh, think there's no simple natural way to explain them. And so they fall back on the anthropic solution. Um, and this, for example, we have the anthropic bound that was obtained in 1987 by, we by Weinberg. And uh, if you believe in this anthropic bound, then uh, you <laughs> I see people shaking, at least one person shaking his head in the audience here. Then uh, this has some consistency with what's actually been seen. But in any event, this is still regarded as a great mystery because the anthropic bound, or the anthropic principle, is certainly regarded as, as, uh, as controversial. It's um, the idea, for those who don't know what the anthropic principle is, the idea is, of course, that um, there are multiple universes, a vast number of multiple universes, and a very tiny number of those, the cosmological constant is small enough to permit us things like us to uh, develop. So our mere existence indicates that we have to have a small cosmological constant. In all those other universes, the cosmological constant is too big or too, you know, too big in a positive sense or too big in a negative sense. And either one of those is a disaster for the uh, formation of a normal universe and intelligent life. So that's our first mystery. Second mystery is related, what is the dark energy? Because the dark energy looks like uh, the cosmological constant, but it's somewhat smaller. 
this is Nick and uh, Mark Phillips and Alfred Nobel at the Nobel uh, during Nobel Week in Stockholm in, 19, in 2011. Uh, and of course, these were two of the primary people who gave us uh, those, ex those observations that led to the discovery of the dark energy. Uh, Nick uh, started one of the two uh, projects with Brian Schmidt. There were two, as you know, there were two um, observational teams, and Nick started one of those with Brian Schmidt. And the mystery here is that we simply don't know what the dark energy is. So there are vast numbers of theories that have been proposed. Uh, what is indicated by the observations in astronomy is the um, dark energy looks like a cosmological constant, but vastly smaller. So it's a great mystery. Third mystery, how can Einstein gravity be reconciled with quantum mechanics? And this goes back uh, before even I was born, and certainly before nearly everybody in this room was born. This mystery is a very old one. Um, even Einstein was aware of this back in 1916. Uh, it's a very old mystery, more than 100 years old. Uh, and here are some of the people. This photograph was taken in Texas A&M. Uh, and uh, here, this is a representative sample of the approaches that have been used to try to solve this mystery. Here is Mike Duff, who happened to be in this photograph. Chris Pope could have been in the photograph. But uh, when the photograph was taken, uh, Chris was somewhere else, I guess. So, uh, and we have our other string theorist here, who uh, came later. Uh, so string theory is certainly one proposed answer to this question. Uh, this is Bryce DeWitt, who gave us the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation for the wave function of the universe, a different approach based on the ADM composition in gravity that's due to Dick Ornerwitt, who started theory, high energy theory here at Texas a &M, and uh, Stanley Dezer, and um, Charlie Misner, who's not in the photograph here, but who was also there at that time. So starting with this, uh, this uh, canonical uh, reformulation of Einstein gravity by these three people, uh, Bryce DeWitt quantized it and gave us the wheeler DeWitt equation. So that was one approach. And then there are other approaches as well. In the photograph, you'll also see uh, Mary Kay Gaillard, who's over here again at a younger age with Abdus Salam. And uh, uh, this is uh, Bruno Zamino, who gave us, who was one of the co-inventors of uh, supersymmetry to begin with, as well as supergravity later. And Stanley Dessier was a uh, co-inventor of supergravity. And of course, Dick invented a particular version of supergravity. So these are, uh, this is meant just to be a representative sample of the people who have addressed this, this incredibly difficult problem of uh, reconciling quantum mechanics with gravity. And uh, uh, the search continues. String theory has had a lot of successes. The string theorists are brilliant people, but it's a very difficult problem and so forth. There's no convincing resolution of this, this difference between, or this uh, um, inconsistency in a sense between uh, quantum mechanics and gravity. Fourth, our first, fourth question is, what is the origin of the entropy and temperature of black holes? This was given to us by Jacob Beckenstein and, uh, Steve, and Stephen Hawking. Here's Stephen Hawking at uh, a visit to Texas a and many years ago. This is courtesy of Hans Schussler, who took the photograph. This was on Hans's ranch here in, in Texas. And uh, we say he's playing tag with an emu, but certainly he was, he apparently was chasing the emu, or the emu was chasing him, but actually he was chasing the emu. Well, that's definitive, I think. And here's John Wheeler. Uh, he's age four, but what's interesting is, if, the, for those who have met John Wheeler, he looked a little like this even into his 70s and 80s. So this is, uh, this is, this is characteristic John Wheeler. And uh, he invented the term black hole, the term wormhole, and so on. And um, these you know, are two large, major figures in um, the history of black, black holes. And of course, we're in the Hawking Auditorium here. Well, one would like to explain the black hole entropy. Here, BH stands for either Bekenstein Hawking or black hole. And uh, this is the Hawking temperature. Uh, so they're very simple results. They were obtained by Bekenstein and Hawking. Now, Hawking got the factor of one fourth here. Uh, so this is the area of the black hole. This is the Planck length squared. Um, this is the surface gravity of the black hole measured in fundamental units, where H bar is equal to C is equal to one. So these are very simple results. And you'd think there'd be some simple principle that would give you such simple results if you try to explain where the black hole entropy actually comes from. But it appears that some major principle has been missed because there's been a lot of work to try to understand this. This is the uh, tomb of uh, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. Here you can see 
This famous formula, entropy equals Boltzmann constant times the logarithm of the number of accessible microstates, W. Uh, so one would like to explain things in terms of this Boltzmann entropy, but it may very well be that something is different about black holes. It may be that the inherently uh, the black hole entropy is different from ordinary entropies. There are results that are based on this idea of counting microstates, you know, trying to get W. And uh, in string theory, there have been successes. Uh, but to my knowledge, there are no successes for real black holes in uh, four-dimensional space-time. The, the things I know about are uh, extremal black holes in five dimensions, things like that. So apparently, they, there's, it's elusive to get a simple formula that applies to all black holes. And yet, we have the formulas here. And of course, one mystery is, why does the black hole entropy go like the surface area instead of going like the volume? Because for everything else, the entropy goes like the volume. So this is still a mystery. People are working on it, but it's still an open question. Where does the black hole entropy in the temperature come from? Uh, then a related question is, is information lost in a black hole? Uh, there are two possibilities for black hole thermodynamics. One is, it's a merely statistical uh, property, just like for other systems in nature that we know about. Entropy is usually a measure of the ignorance of an observer. So maybe that's what it is. And that would represent the, the uh, using the Boltzmann formula and trying to count microstates. And then presumably there's a deeper theory. The string theorists would say string theory. Um, a smaller group is the loop quantum gravity people who would say loop quantum gravity. But um, so far, there's not a convincing um, interpretation of what the deeper theory is. Nothing that's, that really uh, has everybody electrified and convinced that the theory is the final version of things. Well, the, the, the alternative is that if, these are in, if the entropy and temperature are fundamental features and they're determined directly by gravity and quantum mechanics alone without counting microstates, then uh, this would indicate that the black hole, that the, that the information is lost when, when an object goes into a black hole. So if you throw an encyclopedia into the black hole, then the information is lost when it emerges ultimately as Hawking radiation. Um, there are lots of... Uh, interpretations of the uh, black hole entropy and temperature, along with resolutions of this uh, question, and uh, but none of them have proved to be uh, convincing. So this is still an open issue. Is information lost in the black hole? And there are still bets that are open on this, uh, even though uh, Hawking, for some reason, conceded his side of one bet for reasons that nobody really completely understands. Then we have the issue of inflation. Uh, there was a purported observation that would uh, demonstrate uh, inflation through the bicep experiment, but that's gone now. So we don't have uh, any direct uh, confirmation of the inflationary period. This would be in a period when the universe expanded enormously at about 10 to the minus 37, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Uh, we have indirect confirmation. I mean, it's consistent with the observations. For example, for the uh, Planck uh, measurements of the inhomogeneities and the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, so the, the near scale invariance of this is consistent with a with inflation, and there are other in, uh, indirect con indirect consistencies with inflation, but so far no direct um, confirmation. Another issue is why does matter still exist? We are here. We're made of matter, and the simplest interpretation of what happened in the early universe implies all matter and antimatter annihilating with nothing left over. But for some reason. When the antimatter was annihilated, a little bit of matter was left over, and that's what makes up us and the things we see. Um, the major uh, pillar for understanding this, um, the fact that we have persistence of matter, uh, are the um, Sakharov criteria, due to Andrei Sakharov, shown here back in the 1940s. And uh, he gave us three conditions. And one of these conditions is there must be a violation of uh, CP, which means uh, turning particles into antiparticles and changing left into right, essentially. So the, the opposite, this, there is CP violation in the standard model, but it's not enough to give, uh, to satisfy the Sakharov criteria. So there's still a search for the new physics that would allow us to understand why matter persists after the early universe. What's the dark matter? Uh, we have, at Texas A&M, we have representation in both of the leading experiments in the search for dark matter through direct searches. Um, 
This means terrestrial collisions with atomic nuclei. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not missing names again, but we know who the names are. Uh, we also have uh, a major representation for FDLHC, CMS for uh, seeing the dark matter particles in, in the accelerator experiments, if they're, for example, a neutralino, supersymmetric particle. We used to have a representation here, but Peter has three enormous projects going on right now while running our department, so he is not a member of the AMS project anymore, but, it, but initially it was representation for this. This is the search for uh, radiation or particles from dark matter annihilations. And of course, the, uh, the uh, beginning goes back to astronomy. Astronomy demonstrates that there is dark matter. There's a competing idea of modified gravity, but uh, that is almost disconfirmed totally by the observations. So the astronomers tell us that there is dark matter. This is uh, Fritz Wicke, who through the observations of galactic clusters uh, came to the conclusion there should be dark matter. Uh, this is Vera Rubin, who later saw in the rotation of uh, stars or matter in general around galaxies that there, should be, there has to be dark matter. The idea is that the, the, the uh, particles or the galaxies are moving so fast that you need uh, a stronger force of gravity to hold them in at those high speeds. And um, so these are the people who gave us dark matter. The belief in dark matter became very strong through these observations. And unfortunately, she died before she was able to win the Nobel Prize that she deserved for this uh, 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 remarkable set of observations back in the 1970s. Fritz Ricci, 1930s, Vera Rubin, 1970s, persisting into the 80s. So that's a mystery. What is the dark matter? Now we have various mysteries, and we have, uh, I don't know how much time, there's no clock here, right? So uh, Ryan is going to tell me when I, have, when I have 10 minutes left, in other words, when it's 40 minutes after, tell me. When it's 40 minutes after, let me know. And we'll, we'll, 20 minutes to go, okay? So this, uh, we're making our way through these, these things, so I'm now going to speed up a little bit and have multiple uh, questions per slide. So this question is, why are the particles of ordinary matter copied twice at higher energy. This ordinary matter means fermions. So we know there are three generations of fermions. That means three generations of quarks, three generations of leptons. So the electron is copied uh, by a muon and a tau particle. Why do we have these copies? Um, here are, here's the Nobel Prize for, for, night, for 2008. Um, these, uh, Kobayashi and Moskawa won it for uh, showing that the CP violation that was observed by uh, Cronin and Fitch in 1964 could be explained if there were a third generation of particles. So essentially they explain the CP violation as they're in the standard model, and at the same time we're essentially predicting that there's a third generation. The third generation was then seen afterwards, so this was a, a, uh, uh, a great prediction, and uh, this is the Nobel Prize they received for, for that work. But we still have the mystery. Why are there three generations? Nobody knows. What is the origin of particle masses and what kind of masses do neutrinos have? Well, you may have been told that the mystery of uh, what is the origin of particle masses has now been solved because the Higgs boson was discovered. But that's not enough because the Higgs boson has to couple to the fermions. And the question is, uh, where do those couplings come from? They're called Yukawa couplings. And the question is, uh, how does one obtain Yukawa couplings? The Yukawa couplings that give us the masses, uh, for example, the electron, uh, there's no explanation of where they come from. The string theorists uh, years ago thought there was a possibility of getting it from an internal space, but those ideas didn't work out, so we don't know why we have these Yukawa couplings. And for the neutrinos, we don't know what kind of masses they have. They either have Majorana masses, in which case a neutrino is its own antiparticle, or they have direct masses, or they have both, and the most likely scenario is they have both. Um, but we don't know where these masses uh, come from, in detail at least. And we don't know what kind of masses the neutrinos have. <clears throat> then we have this very big question. That's only one of the 42 questions, but it's a very big one. Is there supersymmetry? That's a big search at the uh, LHC. And um, then we have the issue of why the observed particles have masses that are so small compared to the most fundamental mass, which is the Planck mass. This is one of the two hierarchy problems in particle physics. Um, what, is the grand what is the fundamental grand unified theory of forces? There's strong evidence that there is a grand unified theory that uh, unifies all three of the non-gravitational forces. 
I mean, why do we have this theory? Uh, the most likely theory appears to be SO10, which is the group of rotations in 10 dimensions, but uh, it's still not really understood what the most fundamental group is. And certainly not why we have this fundamental group. Um, Einstein relativity is also called Lorentz invariance. We don't understand why we have Lorentz invariance, but it's incorporated even into string theory. Um, the standard field theory always valid. Uh, string theory relaxes ordinary field theory by broadening particles into strings, which means broadening world lines into world sheets. So that eliminates the divergences of quantum gravity. But, but string theory is very much like field theory in a way. You can write down an action in string theory. Uh, there are a lot of similarities. So string theory is really a rather small extra extension of ordinary field theory, where one has uh, world sheets instead of world lines, or one has strings instead of particles. But uh, uh, this is a big question. As far as we know, uh, Einstein relativity and standard field theory explain everything. There's not a single observational or experimental fact that indicates that uh, Einstein relativity is not always valid or that uh, standard field theory is not always valid. Um, are quarks always confined inside the particles that they uh, compose? Uh, there's asymptotic freedom that says the particles, the quarks, uh, don't see each other uh, strongly as they get close together or at high energy. But the opposite uh, idea, that they should be bound together, has not been rigorously proved yet. Now, uh, Lattice QCD theory apparently is indicating more and more strongly that the quarks are bound, but yet the rigorous theorem is not there yet. Uh, what, is the, what are the complete phase diagrams for uh, non-abelian gauge theories, non-trivial forces, like the strong nuclear force? And here I've stolen this figure from Saucia's paper. Um, and uh, the uh, anyway, I won't try to explain this. I don't think Saucy's even here anymore, right? But, uh, <laughs> but fortunately, we have Ralph. Ralph can explain the phase diagram if anybody wants to see it explained. But, or, or, or Ronnie can, too, for that matter. So, uh, uh, but this is a, we'd like to see the phase diagram mapped out in more detail. What is really the phase diagram? These, these, are, these are still open issues, big open issues. What new particles remain to be discovered? The theorists have proposed many particles, but uh, there's every reason to believe the experimentalists will see particles that haven't even been dreamed of by the theorists because this has happened over and over again. Um, what new astrophysical objects are awaiting discovery? Uh, we're going to have a visit from Catherine uh, Fries uh, sometime in April. Uh, she'll give a talk then. And uh, uh, she has proposed a, uh, an exotic new object in the early universe. This would be called dark stars. Her dark stars would shine by dark matter annihilation instead of fusion. So maybe there are other mysterious objects out there to be discovered, and certainly there are objects that the observationalists will see that have not even been dreamed of in theory, almost certainly. What do the topological phases remain to be discovered? I was at the March meeting last week, and the variety of things going on in condensed matter physics are truly amazing. Uh, the, um, uh, for example, the possibility of spinning of three, uh, the possibility of pairing of spin uh, three half uh, fermions. This would be a, an electron in the P state together with spin one half. So the total angular momentum would be three halves. And lots of other things at the March meeting last week. Tremendous new things in this matter of physics. Um, what is the future of quantum computing, quantum information, other applications of entanglement? Um, and what is the future of quantum optics and photonics? These are some of our um, quantum optics people. Um, I took Marlin out of this picture because I didn't want to show Marlin twice. This is, by the way, uh, from last year's Nobel Prize. The, um, Susie took this picture. We were there. We've we've gone to the last three Nobel weeks, and uh, she took this picture. Uh, this is uh, Duncan Haldane. Uh, the Nobel Prize went to Costellus and Thales and Haldane. And here he's talking about the very beginning of non-trivial topology in condensed matter physics. 
And he's pointing out that they got unexpected results, but they couldn't even publish the work. And if you go to the Nobel Prize talks, you hear this over and over again. The Nobel Prizes seem to usually go to people who did something that was totally unexpected, uh, something that um, people were skeptical about. For example, you know, blue LED, LEDs. Uh, the story is that there were hundreds of people going to the talks on zinc selenide, and there'd be three or four people going to the talks on uh, gallium nitride, and gallium nitride finally won the Nobel Prize for the successful lighting that we see around us nowadays. In any event, this is uh, something inspirational for those who are having trouble publishing their papers. This means all of us, right? <clears throat> Are there higher dimensions? Is there an internal space? And what's the geometry of the internal space? This is really a spectacular topic in string theory, uh, where you have the geometry of both the fields and the base manifold. And the estimate is that there are maybe 10 to the 500 or 10 to the 600 different possibilities. So um, this is a highly non-trivial subject. Are there exotic features in the geometry of external space-time, the space-time we're used to, not the internal dimensions, that uh, could, per could permit things like even time travel? And here we think about wormholes, for example. How did the universe originate, and what is the fate of the universe? These are unanswered questions. What is the origin of space-time? Why do we have space-time at all? Why is space-time four-dimensional? And why is time different from space? Nobody has answers to those questions. What explains Lorentz invariance or Einstein relativity? What explains Einstein gravity? Why do all the forces, including gravity, have uh, turn out to be gauge theories? Gravity is, is doubly a gauge theory because gravity has both general co coordinate invariance and uh, local Lorentz invariance. And each of those is a kind of gauge theory. And why is nature described by quantum fields? Is physics mathematically consistent? We don't even know if mathematics is mathematically consistent. But uh, physics, you know, we like to think that nature is consistent, and we're trying to describe nature with physics, and we still don't know whether the physical, uh, the formulations we have are, even the simplest ones, really, in most cases, are are mathematically consistent. Then a very deep question, what is the connection between the formalism of physics and the reality of our experience? The only direct experience we have of nature is in our own brains, basically, the experiences that we have in our consciousness. What else, what's going on out there? What is nature really like? Uh, there's this old question, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, one answer is, well, this is not a question for human logic. How can we figure this out? This is just the way it is. So the answer is, why not? Uh, second is due to a philosopher, a very colorful philosopher. 20 minutes. I mean, 20, minutes. 20, 20 minutes to go. Until 50 minutes? No, until, uh, until 5. Okay, then it's 10 minutes to go. Very yeah, good. Go. 10 minutes to go. So, a uh, very colorful philosopher named Sidney Morgenbesser, and uh, his response was, if there were nothing, you'd still be complaining. Frank Wilczek and others have proposed that nothing is unstable. That's why we have something rather than nothing. Nothing is unstable. And there's a whole book on this by Larry Krauss, who was here a few years ago. Uh, but in this vein, in the vein of Frank Wilczek and Larry Krauss and the other people, um, the instability still involves the assumed laws of physics. And the laws of physics are still something. So then the question is, where do the laws of physics come from? So uh, it may be that this question is just beyond ordinary human logic, and uh, maybe we need a new principle about what it means to be unstable. And you can conclude that despite the fact that we have an incredibly accurate and amazing set of physical theories now, um, we still don't really understand nature. We don't have a basic understanding of why we have nature. What is nature, basically? So here's a poem that keeps going through my head. Uh, Susie pointed out this passage. Uh, so let me read it in my hoarse voice. Uh, this is from Emily Dickinson. It's the last set of lines from one of her poems. 
She says, nature is what we know. We certainly know nature. Nature is here in front of us in our experience. But have no words to say. In other words, we can't really say what nature is ultimately. We can um, do theories of it. We can lay down what corresponds to a map of nature. Physical theory is basically a map of nature. But what is nature really? We don't really, we really can't say what nature is. It's heart. So impotent our wisdom is, this means our theories are still limited, and there's still a lot of room for us to understand things, to her simplicity. So this, is, this captures, I think, what, you know, where we are now. We don't really understand nature, but even though we have enormously sophisticated uh, theories. Then moving along rapidly, what is life? Um, life on Earth is based on DNA, viruses, or at the borderline between living and non-living. But what is life in general? How did life on Earth originate? How did complex life origi uh, originate too? This We talked about this earlier. Uh, how abundant is life? What is the destiny of life? We don't know those things for sure. What is the destiny of our descendants? We don't know what the destiny is. We're, we can be terrified the way things are going right now with the technologies, like uh, recombinant DNA, for example. But we have no idea what the destiny is. So we think in terms of our you know, grand, of children or grandchildren or whatever. Um, some of us have children, some of us have grandchildren. Ed has five grandchildren. So, uh, so we're thinking about that, thinking that far along, but uh, what is the ultimate destiny for our descendants? Um, how does life solve problems of seemingly impossible complexity? Um, for example, this protein folding. I once asked someone, what is the deepest problem in condensed matter physics? And I was told it's protein folding. Um, another um, issue, which was pointed out to me by someone who, I don't know if he's here, but uh, someone who's over in, in uh, uh, medical engineering, is uh, morphogenesis. What this means is, you started out as a one-cell creature. And somehow the cell doubled and doubled again. And as those cells began to develop, they knew how to form the very intricate structures of your heart and your eyes and everything else. How did that happen? You know, how could life, how could your cells figure out how to, you know, develop into those very, very intricate structures? And if you see the structure of the heart or the eye, it's just amazing that this structure can emerge through these chemical processes. So this is not understood. Neither of those. Protein folding is not understood. Morphogenesis is also not understood. Um, how can we understand and cure diseases that afflict life? This is not just a practical problem. This is actually an in principle thing. We're talking about solving problems at the, at the cellular level. For example, aging is a kind of disease. And aging is not yet understood. That's one of the things that's not understood in this category. Uh, it may have to do with the telomeres uh, becoming shorter. But nobody really knows for sure why aging occurs. And that's something that goes on at the cellular level. And finally, what is consciousness? Uh, we haven't yet established what physical processes correlate with your consciousness. The, our consciousness is our global awareness of the input, so things are coming in to our brains and, and uh, somehow they're being put together. There's a binding problem of how all these sensations are put together, and uh, that's not understood. And it's not understood whether the consciousness is localized or more, uh, more likely distributed throughout your brain. So those are our 42 questions. And they are still questions. I want to mention that the next thing is how young people are going to solve these problems. So who will solve these problems? We certainly hope that there are no bounds uh, based on gender or ethnicity or nationality or whatever. We hope that uh, science is an international ongoing enterprise that everybody participates in with no uh, you know, discrimination. Uh, here's a picture. Uh, this is Susie back over here, my collaborator. She organized this group of uh, young Swedish girls that are uh, in this group. Uh, when we say Swedish girls, the image that comes to mind immediately is, you know, blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed, and so on. But they're not all blonde and blue-haired. They're not all in that category. And in fact, if you look at the caption, you'll see that these um, girls' parents were born in Finland, Iran, Iraq, Poland, and Sweden. Um, during the visit to the Sprint's laboratory in Grenoble, uh, from Sweden. They um, were accompanied by English, French, Icelandic, Italian, Russian, Swedish scientists. And um, this, you know, this is kind of the future. 
Uh, Susie criticized me for emphasizing women so much in the paper. Uh, if you look at the paper, you'll see there's a heavy emphasis on that. That's not due to my collaborator. That's due to me. And she was the first person to be critical. There have been others, too, who said the emphasis on women was way too strong. But I think it's fair to get some balance going. If you count the figures in the paper, you'll see that actually there are more males represented than females anyway, even after this uh, inverse bias. But uh, in any event, we hope that, uh, that this is the way things happen in the future. Now, a kind of an invitation to you. Uh, this paper, uh, rep represented by this talk, uh, are associated with a series that we're launching in uh, the journal. This is the Journal of the Swedish Academy. And uh, uh, a word of, uh, here is, uh, you can't see this very clearly, but Gordon Chen, who's in our math department, is Gordon here now? No, Gordon's in Cutter. Excuse me, Gordon can't be here. He's in Cutter right now. Uh, but uh, uh, Gordon did this paper. This is one of the papers that's already appeared in the series. The papers will emphasize both basic science of the kind we've been talking about here in technology. And uh, now this is the, the first paper. This is a battalion article on it. And uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Shana Hutchins. Uh, so uh, this is kind of an invitation. If you have a very high quality paper of the kind that you wouldn't think of publishing anywhere else, you might think about this series. Uh, you can go to our journal, and uh, you can talk to me or email me. And uh, the, uh, what we're looking for are papers that are different from ordinary scientific papers. So for example, you may have a kind of review article that would not fit in reviews of modern physics or physics reports or any of the other standard review journals. Uh, and you might have one, if you're senior enough, you might have one that involves a bit of uh, retrospection, you know, thinking back on how things developed. Uh, and those are not typically published in standard scientific journals. So, so this is kind of an invitation. The word of warning is that we do every paper subjected to two referees. So you have to have a paper that will satisfy two standard scientific referees. But we'd like to continue this vein. And Gordon has one of those papers. And we have a lot of others that are, that are, uh, that are coming in. There's going to be a massive set of invitations going out in the next couple of weeks to people around the world to do this. But this is an invitation to people at this university, which is doing great where people are doing great things, to publish a paper unlike what you might publish in another journal. This is Peter's, uh, one of Peter's projects. Uh, can, I, can I quote? I have to ask myself if I can quote Ed on this. Ed said that when we had a competition for department head, uh, we had five people running, and uh, he only found one person to be unsatisfactory. Can I say this? <laughs> this one person was Peter. Because Peter has three, at least three, fantastic scientific projects going. And his energy to develop these projects is being, I'm sure, diminished by his uh, having to put up with the bureaucracy here in this department, in this university. This is just one of the three projects. Uh, so this is the ultimate Hadron Collider. He has researched in detail uh, whether this is feasible and found that it is. But the idea is an underwater accelerator. And uh, uh, he's not thinking on a small scale. This is Houston. This is New Orleans. Yeah, and uh, so we're thinking about something that's big. It would be the very limit, 500 TeV, of what one can hope to achieve with modern magnets or whatever. And um, so this is dreaming on a big scale. And we're hoping Peter will submit a paper based on this for this series. We'll finally give us a paper on this for this series. And then finally, I think the time is about to be up. So uh, here's a picture that Susie took uh, last December when we went there for Nobel Week. This is the Swedish Academy, and you can't see it. It's too bad, but um, this uh, Christina Mo Moberg is president of the Swedish Academy, and uh, she gave us this. Um, she gave a talk introducing the Nobel uh, talks, and uh, among her other statements were, "Today's intelligent um, man-made constructions." Have I got this right? Uh, constructions would have been science fiction 50 years ago. So the bottom line is, you know, what will the young people in the audience here be doing during the next 50 years? Thanks. Well, that was 42 questions. Now we're waiting for some more. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's the seesaw. That's the seesaw mechanism. The seesaw mechanism is beautiful. 
Uh, with the grand unified theory, you can have both Majorana and Dirac. In the standard model, you cannot have either for the neutrinos. The standard model precludes either kind of mass from neutrinos, but grand unified theories permit both types of masses. Um, if they're both there, then the seesaw mechanism uh, drastically diminishes the, uh, the mass of the neutrino. So the, the mass of the neutrino can start off as being like the mass of an electron, same, same order of magnitude. And that's, that's due to the Higgs, okay, for example. Uh, but you, so you start off with the standard mass like you have for standard model particles, and then you introduce a right-handed neutrino. Uh, they're coupled, and the coupling gives you a two-by-two two matrix, and you solve it. And this is called the seesaw mechanism. The neutrino mass falls way down. And so you explain why the neutrino masses are so small in addition to explaining why they have a mass. Yes. The what? Say it again. Right. For lack of time, I didn't mention all the predecessors. For example, Mike Duff uh, had, was, was commissioned by the string theorist in two year, at the turn of the millennium. Uh, he was commissioned to uh, generate the top questions. And of course, it has a very strong string theory uh, bias. But uh, they had a list of 10 questions. That's Mike Duff's list. Uh, of course, Vitaly Ginsburg has the most famous list. Uh, and that, that was a list that he composed at, uh, near the beginning of the new century. Um, and there are other lists, too. Uh, so there are lots of lists like this. And, of course, Carlo could generate a list, I'm sure, of a, you know, several hundred questions. Uh, um, and you could, too, for that matter. Sure. Uh, because, um, well, so there, there are lots of lists, right? When we venture into biology, uh, we're a little bit out of our depth most of, most of the time because aging is not a hormonal thing, probably. Aging is probably a combination of damage and uh, the telomeres becoming shorter and all kinds of other things. But uh, that is an interesting question, right? Yes? I think it's derivative. You didn't mention the intelligent life is also something that actually Right. Right. I'm going to refer Nick to the paper in which he's featured so strongly, which he hasn't read. Because if you look at the paper, uh, we actually show a lady in California who is uh, one of the people who is involved in this kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we mentioned this, and we mentioned the names. Uh, this is terrible. I've forgotten the name of the lady who ran SETI. Jill Charter, right. So we mentioned Jill Charter. We mentioned this other lady who's primarily interested in the teaching about uh, the search. But uh, we do mention the paper. So if you look there, you'll see you know, a small section on the search for intelligent life, right? Right. 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 And you astronomers are always there in the popular press because everybody loves your work so much. Uh, so we can find... Uh, references to both of these, these topics in the popular press, but certainly we weren't, you know, we we're very much aware of that, right, sure. 
Joe Torter was the, uh, if any one person was the inspiration for the leading character in the movie Contact, uh, she is that person. Yes. Right. There are observational constraints. Um, the, there is certainly antimatter in the universe. I mean, there are certainly positrons and antiprotons, you know, flowing around. And AMS, for example, is observing, you know, antiprotons and is observing positrons and so on. So, so AMS, that satellite experiment called AMS, uh, is certainly observing these things and other satellite experiments too, Fermi and so on. So there are various satellite experiments that are observing antimatter, but it's a very small amount. And the, um, the you know, you can, you can imagine scenarios where some remote galaxies, you know, consist of antimatter, but you have to really strain to make that fit into any plausible scenario in cosmology because the ordinary cosmology explains things so well quantitatively nowadays, in the year 2017, that you really, it's a real stress to try to bend cosmology to make that antimatter come out and remain stable. Right. Right. He's thinking in terms of something a billion light years away, you know, some little island that somehow miraculously came out, I think, in cosmology that still is antimatter. Yeah. The, the observational constraints are very tight, and theoretically it's, it's unimaginable if there's a lot of antimatter out there. You said that was the last question. I guess it was, maybe. So, uh, good. Thanks,